it's always good to start a show with a laugh. And I think that's going to be really super yeah. easy with our guest this week, Kathy Klotz, Klotz guest. Wow, bad. Okay, we're just going to go right to the book. Stop <laughs> boring me. And I'm not going to bore you this week because I've got Kathy and it's just going to be awesome. This book just came out. You really need to read it, especially if you create content, because if you're boring people, that's your problem. Mm -hmm. It's not Kathy's problem, but she can help you. So Kathy, why don't you give us a little intro to who you are and why you wrote the book? Well, thanks, Janet. It's always fun to be here. I love talking to you. Um, and we did have a good laugh before we went on camera. So it's a, it's a great way to start out my day. So thank you. <laughs> Um, so I actually came out of high tech. I spent many, many years in high tech marketing and my background is um, I was a senior uh, director of marketing and steeped in high tech MBA. I also have a, a master's in communication and I also spent 20 years and I still do performing comedy. And so I live these parallel worlds of, of branding and marketing in high tech very, very left brain. And then I lived this world of the right brain and mm -hmm. parallel path for many years. Why is it that we can watch a narrative play out in comedy or a play or a 30 minute uh, improvised play, fully improvised, and we're riveted because it speaks to us. And then we go and we write stories in marketing and in high tech or wherever, industry, whatever industry you, you're in. And it's transactional and it's boring and it's horrible and it's not human. And I thought, aha, these things need to be merged. So my mind started going, blah, 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 which is the way, you know, that's basically it's like, normal. Having, yeah. it's like having a thousand <laughs> windows open that never close, people. That's how it is. And, uh, and uh, I, I just started seeing these connection points. And little, over time, I started, um, it started permeating my work. And my work, my storytelling was better. And I started bringing stuff into the workplace. And people were like, how are you doing that? I'm like, I'm just taking tips that I learn. And so um, over all these years, I had, it was second nature to me. And then I started getting all these questions about improv. And, and I think there's a misunderstanding about what improv is. It's all about comedy. And I thought, you know what, this is a, rather than, so I just write a couple of blog posts. It started out with a couple of blog posts. I published it in, in marketing props and then I published in Convince and Convert. And then I started talking to people and more and more I realized this is a book. This is a book. And because I think it's really about helping people think differently and, and about getting rid of transactional marketing and thinking about relationships and people. And I thought this could help a lot of people. So rather than just a couple of blog posts, let's turn this into a book. And it's funny, the book that I set out to write wasn't really this book, mm -hmm. but I'm really pleased with this book because it kind of morphed and took this interesting direction. And I actually think the book that it came out today was better than what I originally planned. So serendipitously, life has a way of sort of um, kind of come, turning out in, in a really interesting way. So that's that's sort of the long and short of it. That's a beautiful way thing about writing books, though, is that, yeah. you know, and I, I find yeah. that with my own books, too. As I write it, I kind of refine where I'm going and it wanders off by itself and I'll try to reel it in. And I'll think, OK, that's part of a next book. But yeah. You know, it really is wonderful. And, and I really enjoyed reading the book. Well, thank uh, you. you. Thank you, you know, we have Lynn Abate Johnson on and hey, she Lynn. has a question for you. She mm -hmm. says, using improv inside of content marketing, do you make stuff up on the fly, Kathy, or you, do you plan and strategize? Let's both. dive right in. Both. <laughs> it's a great question. No, it's a great question. Um, it's both. I think that... Um, Improv is, I think a lot of people think improvisation means improvised. Mm -hmm. Improvised is on the spot. And yes, I do that because that's, I've been doing it for so long that it's just second nature to me. Um, you've probably seen some of my silly videos. That's just an idea that I had that nobody said no to me on. So then I went and did it. <laughs> but, but I also believe that improvisation, when I use improvisation in this book, um, it's really about taking the principles that improvisers use to create stories on a stage mm -hmm. and being purposeful and mindful and mindful and strategic about them, uh, in content marketing. So it's really both. So I'm a big proponent of making sure that you're you're using the principles of improv like focusing on other people um being human finding the human need at the center of your story and all these things but also don't miss an opportunity when you have an idea a low risk idea to just see how that works before you invest a lot of money and time going down that road of, of developing content it doesn't hurt to just do a quick sort of 
uh, prototype or, you know, agile rapid prototyping and see, does it work? Do people like it? Mm -hmm. Do you do that if you're working with a team, for example, do you do that with like a whiteboarding process? You know, I do yeah. a lot of mind mapping in meetings. Does that work for you? Yes. One of the ways we do it is mind mapping. The other way is to have people play games. So I'm a big mm. believer in games because play, <laughs> I like play. I think there's something about play that unleashes our most creative energies and we're all playful. Every human being is. I think some, something happens in between like school and work that just kind of turns that kind of, you know, that dials that down, unfortunately. So I'll play a lot of games. And part of what games do is help people make connections between things they wouldn't ordinarily see. So one of my favorite things to do is get people to do mashups and just see connections. And, you know, mm -hmm. what happens if I take our content and I combine it with this over here? Do I have a new idea in a whole new way? So by getting people to get out of the same way that they approach it over and over and over, they don't see anything new. But when you change up the way that you do things, so if you're a mind mapper, there's nothing wrong with that. It works. But if you actually say, you know what? We always mind map. Let's do something different. You will see something you didn't see before. So I'm a big believer in disrupting your own comfort zone mm -hmm. and doing these in teams. And I'm a big believer in, the, well, the central tenet of improv is yes and. So you have to make sure that, you know, if there's that person that always likes to be the devil's advocate because they think it's their job, it's like you kind of have to just go, all right, we're just going to play right now. So there's no wrong way to play. Mm -hmm. Let's just let's just get all the ideas out on the table. And then and that to me is where the, the, the burst of like aha moments are play, disrupt yourself. One of the things that I thought was that just snagged me from the book was being aware of your butts. And I, I thought it was both hysterically funny and so apt. And I know that I do in a meeting too. I'm like, but, 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 and you turn that into ands. Can you expand on that process a little bit? Absolutely. I, I, I always like to laugh and say, be aware of your own big butts. Um, your big butt, um, the big butt in the room. Um, cause I think as human beings, it's really interesting. Um, we, we go to a yes, but place. And a lot of times we're not even aware that we're doing that. Mm -hmm. And so, but, but yes, but, 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 and even, you know, I, I catch myself. I, I, but I, we all do it. It's human, it's human nature. Yes. But here's the thing. It's like, there's a place for but, like in, in a story where but signals the disruption of the status quo. But has a perfect place there. But when you're in a brainstorming meeting or you're in a sales meeting and you're trying to get convergence of ideas and get on the same page, a yes but is really a no because a but says, okay, you're trying to have your cake and eat it too. I hear you. That's what the, the yes is. But a but negates everything that you said. And what it does is it over time shuts people down. I mean, you think about your own experience. We all as human beings have been there where we're talking to somebody and all they do is butt every idea. Mm -hmm. After a while, you just you stop wanting to try. And you, you start thinking that no matter what you do, whatever idea you generate, somebody's gonna shut it down before they're they even butt you. Yes, they're gonna butt mm -hmm. you before they've even heard the idea in the in its entirety. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a very human thing. We all do it. We all do it. However, I encourage people to really try to yes and an idea because when you yes and, it'll change the energy. You'll get better ideas. It doesn't mean you have to actually go and execute on that idea. And that's the thing. I think people fear that if they say yes and to something, that means that they're writing a check to go do it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that at all. That's not what it is. It mm -hmm. just means that I want you to be at your best creatively. And if I keep shutting you down, after a while, you're going to want to slap me. Because it's just, you know, no human being likes to be yes butted all the time. So yeah. it's just, it's, we're just wired for it. And if we can just be a little bit more aware of that, I think it, it'll change the dynamic of your conversations. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I like that you mentioned in the book that um, <clears throat> then you can turn it into an and and say, yes, and we're going to do that in the next iteration or, yes. and we can get to that yes. later or whatever. And, and that's exactly. a really great pattern to recognize in ourselves and be more mindful of yes. how we're using our language. So I, I thought that was really great. Thank you. Yes. Yes. And I think it's something <laughs> that, 
It really is interesting because I think it really, you know, I've talked to, to different, different walks of life and that little exercise is funny. I'll, I'll have people from all over come back to me and say, well, not only did that help me in business, but it helped me with my spouse or my partner. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think yes and is such a way to validate and, and, and say to somebody, I hear you. I really hear you. And mm. we could all be more mindful about that. I think that our conversations and our relationships would be better. And again, I love that what you put it so elo eloquently. It's, you know, you're not yes and in the iteration. We're not we're not saying we're going to do it now. There's no commitment. You know, and if people can separate the two, I th you know, that, that you're not signing up to do something you don't want to do. You're just saying, yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Tell yeah. me more about it. And we all want to be heard, you know, yeah. even if our idea is something that we're skying and maybe we're not even fully behind it. Yeah. But we want to participate in the conversation. Yeah. So how can we bring more empathy into those kind of team discussions or project discussions? How does how does that how do how does comedy and empathy kind of go together in that meeting? How can we do that? Gosh, that's such a great question. It's such a great question. Um, I, I think, you know, it's, it's funny. People always ask me, well, what does comedy have to do with, you know, any, any of this? And, you know, it's very simple to me. It's very foundational. The epicenter of the heart and soul of comedy is the truth. Mm. And if you, if you go to a comedy club and you watch a comedian, the reason you're laughing so hard is you recognize the truth at the heart of everything they're saying. And that's what makes you like, you know, yeah, you know, cry because you're like laughing so hard. You're like, I hear that. That's my life. And you identify. So it, the foundation is truth and empathy. It's understanding what that is. And I think the way that you bring it into a lot more of your team discussions is putting yourself in the mind of the user and everybody, uh, the people around who are all brainstorming. And that's why it's so important to just say, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to listen to what everyone has to say. We're not going to use no. And we're not going to use but. Mm -hmm. um, just let's all those stop words. Don't stop. No, all these stop words just shut people down. We're going to just get rid of that. What we want to do right now is what what's what's our customer thinking? How can we be more in the mind of our customer? What are their problems? So a lot of way to get out of it, too, is that but happens when it becomes my idea versus your idea. And we're mm -hmm. jo jockeying for like the position of mine versus yours. But when you start talking about our let's collaborate our and let's talk about customers and there, then it becomes, you don't take it personally because it's not about your idea versus Bob's idea or, you know, um, Chris's idea or, you know, Leslie's idea. It becomes, let's, let's help our customer. What are they dealing with? And I think, mm -hmm. so can you, if you can get out of the my versus your and get into the we or the our or their, the customer, it does have this interesting effect where people don't feel it's their idea being shot down. And then, and they they remove they start to remove their own lens from it, and then they start to realize, oh yeah, it's not about me. It's about the mm. darn. It's about the customer. Golly, what a concept! <laughs> what a concept! <laughs> but it does feel personal when somebody yes buts your idea. So it, it, there's a lot of attachments to that, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You see, you do a lot of activities. Are you doing things like you know these kind of brainstorming ideas mm -hmm. where it's like let's put ourselves in the shoes of the customer. Yeah. Let's really you know, find out what it is that they're feeling. Because I think as marketers, we're so often trapping ourselves in our own box and we just can't get out of it. Absolutely. The, one of the exercises I like to do, and there's a couple of them is, all right, let's talk about problems. What is the problem the customer is facing? Let's go through the customer day. And we have this really great um, stage game that we play in improv called Day in the Life. And what mm -hmm. I love about it is like we'll interview on stage, it works this way. Uh, an improviser will interview an audience member a volunteer about their day and then we sort of acted on stage and we take it way over the top but what if you actually did that iteration with your team and said all right day in the life of the customer what problems are they facing by the time they get to your product how's their day been are they frustrated and looking for you to solve something or are they coming to you happy um what's not working for them let's put our you know let's apply this this improv technique and sort of figure out what's the mindset of that customer mm. um, and another game i like to do is is just even mashups so often we're busy as companies thinking about what kind of content should we create about our stuff? Wrong way to think about it. What yeah. are the what are the interests? Pick three interests of your user base. Um, I did this for a company, and one of the things they found is that a high percent of their rabid fans were dog owners, and so they started creating content around the interests of their fans, mm -hmm. dogs. 
no shock, it worked really well because it's they started getting out of the mindset of, well, let's talk about our some great content around our products and us and this. Let's focus on three things. The top three things our users care about. What problems do they have? What's their day like? What are their interests? What are they passionate mm -hmm. about? And if we created content around those interests, wow, we're going to make content that they care about, not about us, but what, what they care about. So focus always on the interests and passions. Think about the passions of your customers. And here's a big hint. It's got nothing to do with your products. <laughs> they don't care they about don't your care product until they want it. Until they need it. Mm -hmm. So figure out, is it, is it, is it, are they parents? Are they busy moms? Are they, mm -hmm. are they pet owners? Are they rabid environmentalists? You know, Patagonia knows this. Um, mm. Figure out what makes them tick. And if you create content around those passions, you're golden, you're golden. So that's a big, big thing that's, that I help customers kind of think about. Yeah, I think that's huge. And you know, we've talked about it a lot with things like music and also with creating yeah. images for social, yes. you know, creating things that they're going to relate to. If you're gonna talk mm -hmm. about cars and your audience is boomers, put a Mustang in it, you know, a nice yes. 65 Mustang or a Camaro or something yes. that they're going to relate to. It may not be, what you think it is it's you know yeah. so figuring out what their demographic really is and what their areas of interests are especially important yes. with images that you're creating because that's what they're going to see first they're going to gravitate towards that beautiful yeah. hot 65 66 <laughs> mustang you want to market to me that's what you sell yeah um you it, know exactly yeah it's it's um really putting yourself in their shoes, which really goes back to an older theme that you do carry through this book too, about making things human. Yeah. Duh. Yeah. It's yeah. So basic. It is so basic. And it's so interesting that, you know, it, it's funny. I was talking to another um, podcaster and we were both laughing because, you know, human, humans sort of jump the shark in a lot of ways because mm -hmm. everybody's human, human this, human that. And I, I did a, I wrote a parody for Medium because I was like sick of people just putting pictures of people on their website and saying, we're a peoply company and we do peoply things <laughs> and we talk about people and that makes us human. And it's like, that is just the most ridiculous whitewashing of what being human really is because being human is an inside job. It's caring about your mm. people. So I still think it's important but it's so easy to forget. And I think the reason that we all forget is that we're so busy trying to get to the sale. Again, trans transactional, we have our transactional hats on as marketers. We need to, yes, metrics matter, ROI matters, all that stuff. I would be horribly remiss if I said it didn't matter, but you can't get there by doing an end run around your customer's humanity. Hmm. The way that you get there and the way that you sustain a relationship is acknowledging the humanity of your customers. So I know everybody's in a hurry to get to the sales, but you think it's a shortcut, it's not. It's, there, it is a long cut. And in the end, you do a lot of damage. So if we could all just step back and go, all right, they don't care about my product, but you know what they care about is credibility. They care about visibility in their team. They care about a chance to get promoted. If we can just think like a human being and what they need and want, my gosh, it would just be so much easier, you know? Yeah, and I, I think I yeah, I do think humanize and and for that matter, mindfulness have jumped yeah. the shark to some extent. Yes. But it doesn't yes. mean that it isn't important and that it isn't really yes. useful to people. Yeah. And you know, it really isn't about, you know, putting up the here are the pictures <laughs> of our team. Aren't we great? You know, <laughs> yeah, that's that's just total bullshit. But exactly. what really exactly. works is humanizing who the market is and actually yeah. getting to know them. And, and I like, you know, to think, okay, let's say that my market is the guy across the street. Great. Then I have somebody to talk to, yeah. you know, they do all the, I'm sure that you do a lot of building avatars and that kind of thing, you know, per, personas, whether you want to call them avatars or not of who the market is but don't do it just with the marketing team. Exactly. Gosh, that's so well said. That's so well said. And that's why I love talking to you about mindfulness because I think you're right. I think the way that most um, businesses approach personas is, is shit. Mm. Um, sorry, I said it. <laughs> um, you know, um, 
it's I just it my PBS. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> the sensor button. Oh God, Kathy's on. Eh, 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 eh. Just a monkey hitting a button completely. <laughs> Um, here, here's the thing, uh, it, and you know this, you just said it so well. I think, I can't tell you how many times I just think that most approaches to personas are so wrong. It's like, let's talk. Yeah, if, if, if I'm Home Depot and I'm just randomly picking them out of my head because I spend so much of my time as a homeowner at Home Depot. Um, but it's like, you know, the fact that I am female um, and a certain age, like has nothing to do with my loyalty to Home Depot. Who gives a crap? I'm a homeowner. Mm. I'm fixing up my house. I love to do homeowner, you know, home projects and do it yourself stuff. That's more relevant. My behavior is more relevant. Who cares that I'm, you know, what my gender is? Who? That's not relevant to my identity as a fix it yourself kind of gal and wanting to get in there. And that's more relevant. And so when I see these archaic arcane, you know, personas, I just want to rip my hair out. And it's, I've seen it across every industry. I've seen it in tech. It's like, oh, the confused housewife that doesn't understand technology. <laughs> oh, you know, it's like, come on, that's archaic. You're a lot of smart, mm -hmm. savvy women and they're making the purchase decision for the, for the house of what computer the kids use and all this stuff. And it's like, so I guess I, I'm a little, I'm a little, Frustrated that there's still that lingering demographic mentality instead of the psychographic. Let's look at the behavior. What do they want? What do they need? What do they care mm -hmm. about in the world? And that's where I think that most um, approaches to persona development, really, that's what I see fall short. When By the time it gets to me, I'm like, what is this? I don't even understand it. Mm. You know? mm. Well, I was cracking up because I've actually gotten, I, mm. I, order stuff online at Home Depot so I can go pick it up because otherwise it's like a candy store. I'll spend three days in there and I'll buy a gutter or something. Yeah. I buy all kinds of weird things at Home Depot. So they started targeting me on Facebook and I'm getting the pink hammer. Really? A pink hammer. It's like this little tiny, it's so cute. Oh my, please shoot me. Who thinks that's me? Who thinks that's me? It's... Yeah. So annoying. It is. It's like so annoying. it just. I just want to get all these decision makers in a room and say, you know, there's no feminize it spray. It's not like I know what women want. We'll just oh, make course. it. We'll make it pink with flowers. Uh, no, no, yeah, that's no. not functional, and nobody cares. And that that's still sadly an approach, and it just kills me. It kills me when I see that behaviors. To your point, find mm. find that in interest. What are they trying to do? Why do they care? You know, people like you and I love to get our hands dirty and fix things. And that's really the mentality of who we are. Um, mm -hmm. And we, we like to maybe donate and we like to be involved in community activities, find those angles of who we are as people and behaviors, not, you know, try to give me some glittery pink, smaller for my delicate feminine hands because <laughs> a power tool oops my feminine hands don't know what to do with a power I'm tool so scared. give me a break i'm so yeah. scared so well, you know, really if they if it, if they actually looked at the demographic particularly in silicon valley right you know we live in the valley we're fast movers the reason i order in advance is because i want to be in and out as quickly yes. as possible yes. focus on that not the stupid pink hammer yes. or the little tiny drill that has the extra small handle for i don't know maybe that's a different stereotype i'm not sure it, but it, it's wrong it's totally <laughs> wrong and, and it's totally wrong and it, and yeah your points it's really well said it's like is it convenience is it in and out is it is it that I like a certain type of project? Is it even like for me, um, I like to take my son um, and my husband does too. We like to do things with our with our son and like, you know, making a birdhouse. My, my son did not enjoy it as much as my husband and I did, but it was a family <laughs> activity. And, um, <laughs> and so I enjoy things that I can do with him. So it's sort of mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. So find those behavioral things that your audience cares about. I care that they donate money back to, to the community. I care about those things. Mm -hmm. I don't care about what color your stuff is. And, and if you can find those kinds of things, that's the way to approach empathy. So really, really, I can't emphasize this enough. If you're using those kinds of archaic demographic things, throw them out. Just please mm -hmm. do me a favor, 
throw it out unless it's relevant. If we're talking cosmetics or hair care or something where gender and age and all that stuff matters, then by all means it's relevant. But but you have to really be judicious about that. And it's get, not a blanket thing. It's not a blanket thing. Mm. It's not a blanket thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now that we've gone a little <laughs> bit to that direction, let's talk about what about when uh, the reaction is negative? Yeah. You know, when you're getting huge pushback from your customers about yeah. pink hammers or whatever yeah. it is, when is conflict a good thing? And how can we work with it to kind of move people yeah. where we want them to go? Well, conflict's a great thing. You know, one of the things that I think companies sometimes really downplay is they think conflict is bad. Now, conflict is bad if you if it's unhealthy, if it's unproductive, if it gets you nowhere. But conflict can be a really great thing. I mean, diamonds are, are polished and all the facets happen because of friction. Friction is a good thing. Um, it's how you apply it. So, uh, you know, it's sort of, if it can be used to dig deeper, Hey, you know, don't be step. Here's the thing. When when conflict makes us reexamine the status quo, that's a great thing. Because if it's status quo, here's what that means. Everybody's doing the same thing you are and you're not doing anything new. You're not standing out. You're not differentiated. So if you're worried about shaking the status quo, then wrong attitude. But if conflict comes and says, how can we disrupt the status quo? That's the that's good conflict because mm -hmm. it means you're willing to look deeper about what your customers really want. And if no one else is doing that, you may be the first to actually uncover a need that no one else actually thought about. Though, and and you have to be open to telling these kinds of stories. <clears throat> Businesses are so scared to talk about conflict for themselves, conflict for their customer, but sto good storytelling needs conflict because. We're looking to solve a problem and and without conflict there's really no story mm. so embrace healthy conflict that's a good thing think of it as contrast it's contrast it's a great thing conflict is not bad it's just it's as long as it's healthy conflict mm -hmm. so yeah. how do we work with that conflict once it happens say that you know we're getting a lot of pushback on i'll stick to social networks for now yeah um you know how do we deal with that conflict to turn it around and make that into a positive event such a great question and i think that's really the ultimate question for social media and i think the beauty about social media is that we can have conflict and we can get better so the way that i've always looked at it is if conflict is if i got a bunch of of people telling me the same thing that you know this isn't working, then that means that I'm not doing my job as a marketer, and I can t I should take that as good constructive feedback that my audience is telling me, and mm -hmm. fix the problem. Invite some of those people to be on a customer advisory board. Invite some of those people to help you beta test a new product. Invite some of those people to help you think about how to fix the problem. You know, your the loudest voices are not. Um, they're, they're not your enemy. Um, the loudest voices are the people who are telling you be something usually you want to hear. As long as it's you know respectful, it's legitimate. There's always trolls. We're not talking about that. Right. But the people who are, have legitimate issues, man, you should be grateful because those people are telling you what you need to fix. And the, the way that I do it is you're not going to convert everybody, but I say embrace that and invite those people to interact with you and help you solve the problem. I think that's a great way to make them feel heard. Yes, and them. Yes, and them. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Traditional yes, and. Yes, and we hear you. What would you build? Would you like to co create something with us? Mm. Boy, boy, I tell you, I, I have invited people, and not everybody says yes, but a number of people will go, you know what? I'd like to do that. Those people are going to be your champions. Yeah. Yeah. And they're, they really are. They're going to become your champions and your evangelists because. Yeah. A, they felt heard, yeah. which is huge. People just want to be heard yes. and understood. Mm -hmm. And even if that's all that, that happens from the interaction, that's great yeah. because they feel heard. Yeah. Most of the time, though, they will come back and at least talk to you in some form. They may come back mm -hmm. and tell you to go to hell, but they may <laughs> come back and, and say, you know, wow, I can't believe you heard me and you actually listened. Yeah. Um, you know, I was at a nonprofit conference years ago and this has stuck with me forever. And it was a nonprofit that dealt with uh, mount, mountaintop destruction. So it was mm. about coal mining where they were just leveling these mountains. Wow. And they're, you know, they were trying to promote the environment 
And they were also trying to do some things to get people jobs that weren't related to this mining. And one of the local miners was trolling them everywhere, mm -hmm. constantly on their blog, constantly on their social media, saying they were trying to destroy the valley and take away all the jobs for the, for the neighborhood. And finally, the nonprofit found out who this guy was and they took him out for coffee and they sat down with him and explained all the things they were doing to try to bring different business into mm -hmm. the neighborhood and why this was so important. And he became an evangelist for them. And it was really yeah. a huge effort for them, but it paid yeah. off so well. That's a great so story. Well. That's a wonderful story. That's a, that's a, yeah. that's, how, that's how you should do it. That's the way to do it. It's interesting. I, it's, I think there's probably some percent of these trolls that actually are probably have legitimate issues. I think the mm -hmm. hard part is we're so attuned to dismissing trolls because of the way that they go about it. And I, I think that uh, the ones that have legitimate issues, and if you can assess that out, um, and it's a tricky one, you know, because the people who usually have a legitimate issue will approach you in the most respectful way, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's a hard one, but that's a great story. I love it. Yeah. Or, you know, if they're really just whining trolls, you can go on the stage of, you know, yeah. President of the United States and say, stop whining. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Pretty awesome. He did that about, oh, I don't know, a little, an hour ago. Maybe. I loved it. Yeah. No, it was awesome. He's great. He's great. Yeah. 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 So going to miss him. Too. Not to be too political, yes. but yeah. So anyway, <laughs> yes. And. Yes and. Yes, yes and. and. Get out there and vote people because if you don't vote, we're all going to lose. That's right. That's, um, right. that's my political statement for the day. Uh, you know, I, I really, I, Gosh, I could talk to you forever. I so enjoy talking to you. And I, I really want to tell people that, you know, this is, you got to read the book. Yay. Can you see that? Yeah, you see that? She said it, it really, it really is. <laughs> and I only just got it actually in, in hardcover uh, Sunday. So I've been digging through it and it's, it's getting all highlighted and, you know, having, having an mm -hmm. e-copy so I can take notes works better for me, but it really, uh, it, I like it. I oh, know. thank you. Well, I want, here's what I want, I'm going to ask you to do and everybody who has a hard copy. I would really, really, really love it. If you did something fun with it, take a picture, do something fun. I, I want this book to be playful, um, and I want it to inspire some fun ideas, so do something, take a picture of yourself doing something, you know, the pressure is on. Yeah, no, no. The pressure is <laughs> the pressure is on because here's the thing. I everybody deep down inside is funny and playful. We sort of accepted a status quo in marketing that we don't have to. And it's about bashing all that and, and really having fun and giving your inner child a big old permission slip. Go do something fun. And then you can take a picture of it. Um, Kathy Cloak's guest, and then um, as, as uh, my friend Lynn is reminding me, thank you, Lynn. Uh, hashtag stop boring me book selfie. Um, yes. Because then what we'll do is we will take those pictures and we'll put you in a Facebook album and just have some fun. So I just want people to have fun with it. Yeah. Fun. So I really encourage everybody to do that. It, it's a really, it's a fun way to do it. And it's also really important that you get the damn book. Get the, so. get the book and, and it wouldn't hurt. Yes. And it's an Amazon review. So, oh, yes. If you like and. it. If you like it. world that I live in of marketing and, and storytelling and this world of improv, both of which I've lived for 20 years and just mm. do this mashup of like why the two belong together. And um, I think what's interesting is, is to hear from people who go, Oh my God, you explained improv. I thought improv was all comedy and now I get it. And that's that alone is like, okay, great. <laughs> yep. Done my job. Gotta go home now. Exactly. <laughs> on, on to the next book. <clears throat> that's great. Yeah. Well, Kathy, why don't you tell people where they can find you? And obviously, they can get the book on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you can find me at keepingithuman.com. Uh, and uh, I've got a blog. I've got lots of ways to contact me. You can also follow me on Twitter at Kathy Clotes Guest. Uh, again, the book is Stop Boring Me. You can go to stopboringme.com. 
And if you've got ideas, here's the thing. I want to see people do some creative, fun stuff. So let me know what you end up doing, what ideas you get inspired by. I, I, I like hearing back from people. Um, that's fun for me. So cool. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you again for joining us for the second time. And gosh, we're going to have to come back, you know, when you do the next book. Absolutely. It's so great talking to you because you were one of the first, I'll just say this, you were one of the first people I know that really wrote, wrote a, a really book about mindful, mindfulness and social media. And it, I guess it has jumped the shark like human has, but that doesn't mean it's not important. It's a super, super, super important thing that we shouldn't just give lip service to. And what I love yes. about you is that you actually walk the talk so it's not something oh. that you just go mindful 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 like let's <laughs> let's run a peopley company a mindful peopley company no let's actually put it into practice so let's be really yeah. really um gonna use a word here authentic but in in a really <gasps> real way but it is on it is on the title of the book so you know but yeah and I, and I feel the same way about you which is why i was so glad to have you on the show and it's there's so much mindfulness in the book so uh, it's thank really you. great. Thank you, Janet. Thank you. It's such a pleasure. And thank you for joining us, Lynn. Yeah. It's always great to have your Hi. input and reading the chat as we go and laughing. Uh, so, you know, it's <laughs> come back, look at the chat. So this video will be posted on YouTube shortly. It'll also be on my Spreaker podcast and I'll put it up on Facebook eventually as well. So thanks everybody for joining us. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Janet. Bye. Bye.